Um, I now want to introduce our two discussants um, who are, are going to build upon some of the uh, great thoughts that um, Cheryl and Eiffel uh, shared with us. Our first um, discussant I'll introduce is Deborah Peterson Small. Um, she has organized uh, statewide voter registration campaigns uh, in New York. She um, has degrees, law degrees, and master's in public policy degrees from Harvard. Um, she was legislative director from, for New York Civil Liberties Union, where she lobbied um, the state legislature on behalf of the poor, disenfranchised, and incarcerated. She founded Break the Change, Communities of Colors and the War on Drugs, a public policy research and advocacy organization committed to addressing disproportionate impact of punitive drug policies on poor communities of color. The mission of this organization is to build a movement in communities of color in support of drug policy reform with the goal of rep replacing our failed drug policies with alternatives based in science, compassion, public health, and human rights. Our second discussant um, I'm proud to introduce is one of our students here, uh, David Bakunle. He uh, received his bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland, uh, degrees in psychology and criminal, criminology and criminal justice. Um, he's part of a pre-doctoral uh, program in the Department of Mental Health and a fellowship program called the Drug Dependence Epidemiology Training Program funded by National Institute of Drug Abuse. Uh, he studied socio sociodemographic associations of tobacco outlet density, e-cigarette availability, and utilization of arts and culture to promote equity and social justice. Uh, he's a multi-talented uh, man, uh, performing artist, uh, is, uh, African storytelling and drumming uh, for 20 years, and he founded um, and is the primary facilitator of Discover Me, Recover Me, an intervention program that utilizes African oral tradition to aid in recovery from societal traumas. Uh, two great discussants, and I'm going to hand it over to them. I think they have some ideas of how they're going to handle their, their time. So thank you so much for having us here. I am in awe of the woman I'm sitting next to. She's one of the people whose careers I've followed ever since I left law school and who's been a constant source of inspiration. So I'm happy to be sharing a panel with you and talking about issues that are so important to all of us. David and I got together during the break and said that we wanted to actually like have a conversation like we were talking to each other. So we're going to ask each other questions and answer them inside of the context of the discussion that we've been having all day today. So the first con question that came up for me when I was thinking about it is that there's, for me, a fairly familiar aspect about the current conversation that we're having concerning police reform in Baltimore and police reform more broadly. I'm not ashamed to say that I'm 60 years old, right. and so I've seen you know, this particular conversation around the black community and police as an issue for us over for the majority of my life. And how it occurs to me is that people of color, particularly black people, are always complaining about their mistreatment by the police and white people tell us it's not as bad as you think or that you just need to deal with it until some major event happens and then we in their opinion, act violently or are somehow engaged in some form of civil unrest, which then requires a response. But the, there's never any response in the complaint outside of a perception of black violence or black unrest. And it occurs to me that this is a very negative pattern that has been going on in this country for a long time. That it's only when white America is fearful about the ability to maintain its control over black communities or our willingness to continue to cooperate with the law as it's being imposed on us, do we ever hear anything about reform. And then those reforms are only cosmetic enough to reinforce a certain level of cooperation with the oppression that allows for business to go on as usual. And so for me, that's the familiar aspect of this, and I don't know how that lives for you. 
we keep having this conversation over and over and, and over again. I, I, for me, it doesn't matter which policy we're talking about, whether it's policing, whether it's education, whether it's housing, whether it's financial services, all these policies, and I'm glad that people are, are saying this, the policies at their core all come from a fundamental disregard for the humanity of people of color. Straight up. And, and to me, I, I think and when it comes to policing specifically, you know, there's, there's two different ways we can go about this. So we can talk about, obviously, the influence of, of racism in policing, of course, and, and that has its place. But let's talk about the issues with the militarization of law enforcement. So we can go back. I, I actually picked this up from a performance that I did uh, in D.C. We were actually celebrating uh, D.C. Uh, emancipation. And these are some of the laws that were in place in 1848 as a result of a revolt uh, that was led not too uh, earlier than that. So, for example, these codes, these district black codes, permitted the killing of runaway slaves, enslaved Africans, if they were caught by the captors. It banned uh, Africans from sitting or gathering in public places. It prohibited free blacks from having parties, playing cards, and dice. And it even dictated that it was unlawful for an enslaved African to fly a kite. Now, doesn't that sound very familiar? <laughs> so what the hell has changed <laughs> in over 150 years? Because it's some of those same reasons that uh, people of color, particularly black males, are accosted by the police. And it just blows my mind, but at the same time, it doesn't. And then we talk about the, the militarization of, of police. And, and I like what we were saying before when we, we equated uh, the structure of law enforcement to the structure of gangs. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge fan of gangland. I don't know if anybody watches that show, but it doesn't taught me so much about gangs. If you think, think, think about it this way. So at the top of the law enforcement, you got your commissioner, your OG. Right. And then we have this hierarchy that brings it down to your other OGs, you know, that in a circle, and all the laws and all the policies of that gang trickle down to who? Your foot soldiers. Who are your foot soldiers in law enforcement? Exactly. Exactly. So is it any surprise? And what do you have to do in a gang to prove your loyalty? Put in work. How is this any different than law enforcement? How is it any different? So I can go on and on, but I know we said like a two to three minute like. <laughs> So, you know, I want to just pick up where sort of you left off mm -hmm. and, and, and draw the historical comparison right. because I think, you know, oftentimes my complaint is that Americans are very ahistorical and so that we tell stories about ourselves that don't actually match who we are. So for me, <laughs> one of the things I think that's really important is to remember that racism is a construction, that people didn't come here as black or white. Black people came here as Igbo, Hausa, Yoruba, San, all the different groups that we belonged to. White people came here as Italians, Germans, Swedes, um, Irish. Irish, Irish, whatever, whatever. And at a certain point, we, were, we had blackness imposed on us. Mm -hmm. I say they traded their ethnicity away from whiteness. But in both cases, it was done in service of something else. What it was done in service of was capitalism, which is a conversation that we don't have this much in this country, which I am very grateful that Senator Sanders has resurrected. Because from my perspective, if you don't remember that the Anglo-American enterprise, of which the U.S. is the most successful spinoff, was actually created for the promotion of addiction for profit, to sugar, to tobacco, to alcohol, that the slave trade was developed in order to expand the ability of people to promote addiction for profit. Mm -hmm. And that the whole purpose of us being here was to be as a source of extraction for those people who were ceased looking to make profit, to extract the physical, human, and spiritual resources of people, and not just of black people. They also did that for white people. And this is where what Sherilyn said earlier to me is so important, because we often don't talk about the ways in which racism really hurts white people and has continued to do so. So my last little historical remembrance is this. 
People forget about Bacon's Rebellion. People forget that one of the earliest rebellions was of black slaves, black people and white people who got together, who fought to get more land because land was the key to upward mobility. And they burned down Jamestown. Most of us don't know that, but they burnt that city down. And the planters had to call for the British to get help in order to put down the revolt. And after they successfully did that, they were like, we got to make sure this doesn't happen anymore. And the way to do that was to create separation between blacks and whites. The first laws that codified blackness and gave an economic and political advantage to whiteness came in the wake of Bacon's Rebellion. But here to me is the important point that we don't remember about that. That white folks didn't get what they wanted. They were fighting for land. What they got instead was whiteness which was not an avenue to upward mobility. All it was was the ability to hold your foot down on other people. And to me, that is the shell game of race in America, that white people have been told or taught to believe that there's an advantage to whiteness when the only advantage to it is the ability to hold somebody else down, not to actually move up. And we're seeing the results of that today. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's wonderful you say that because you, that, that really leads in, into my whole thought process and I'm so glad that there's people in the audience that are going to know exactly where I'm coming from. The myth of black inferiority and the myth of white superiority has caused structural trauma, it's caused economic trauma, it's caused mental trauma, it's caused psychological trauma. And we really don't emphasize that enough. I think we focus a lot on the policies on the macro level issues, but why are we, and I'm coming from a mental health capacity, so this is really what I should be focusing on, right? And I'm really looking at the stressors, not just the environmental stressors, not just the stressors of the built environment and the natural environment or lack thereof in areas that are inhabited by non-whites, which has this correlation or, or, or connection with low socioeconomic status when we talk about the historical connection of creating these classes. But just the stresses, so, so Dr. Williams talked about it. So even when you control for everything, there are stressors associated with just being black or just being Latino or just being Native American. You know, but I'm gonna focus on, on, on black folks because that's, that's who I represent, that's who I am. So these myths that cause these psychological stresses, how do we deal with it? How do we address them? Well, first we have to be introduced to the true history of, of who we are and what we represent. The history that was taken away from us systematically start, if you wanna just start officially at 1619, if you wanna start there officially. There's a, a wonderful video and I'm sure a lot of people uh, have seen it. The uh, unequal opportunity race, people seen that video? To me, that is one of the best explanations of structural racism that ever was. That really, really was. Um, and one of the things, when we talk about policing, uh, I have this paper that I was introduced to by some, some uh, wonderful women, uh, Cheryl Grills, uh, Enola Aird, and Daryl Rowe was the other co-author. And it, I'm going to take from that. It says, racial justice and policing in the United States can only be achieved when policy and practice are accompanied by concentrated attention to the psychological pathology of racial injustice. Yeah, them women are deep. They deep. And, and you're right, it's not just us. Everybody suffers from this disease of racism. Everybody suffers from the disease of classism. Everybody suffers from the disease of sexism. Everybody suffers from the disease of homophobia. We all do. Even if there's one group that's affected more than the other, we all suffer from it. So we all need to be emancipated. <laughs> emancipation, emotional, psychological, and mental emancipation. Because I'm telling you, we can come up with all the policies in the world, but what did, what did Marcus Garvey said that was so uh, wonderfully quoted, quoted by Bob Marley? Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. That's what it takes. For us, to, we have to be in the right mindset to start addressing these macro-level issues. But if we aren't in the right mindset, we're just going to keep 
going over and over and over and over again. So if I have a policy recommendation, is that number one, uh, the implicit association test. You've got to know where's your mind at. And it's not about calling out your sexism or calling out your racism or calling out your biases. If you don't know, how can you address them? You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to call races out. I'm trying to help y'all understand. Some of the best allies that I've ever had in my life are the ones who did not know. And I was given the opportunity to show them, not to put them down, not to say, oh, you racist so-and-so, go over here. No. You're part of this system just like I'm part of this system. I'm fortunate enough to know how the system works. Let me show you. Let me show you why you look at me a certain way. Why you uh, clutch your purse a little bit when you see me. I don't blame you. You've been taught just like I've been taught. But you can be taught a different way. So that's the way I look at it. That's, uh, to me, that's where it starts. You know, that's where it starts. What you so, I, I, can, can I jump in with a, with a yeah, question? Please. So, um, I know that, that both you, Deborah, and, and David, um, have expertise as it relates to drug policy. And it seems to me that uh, when you talk about race and policing, drugs, our drug laws and how we use those drug laws are pretty central to that. I wonder if, if you want to say a little bit about the connection between our drug laws, what you see as a path forward to addressing some of the problems with race and uh, policing as it relates, um, at least to some degree, through our drug laws. So. Um I want to say three things about that. First is that um, <laughs> I literally just left the UN General Assembly special meeting on the world drug problem, which was the second or third time that the UN as a body has attempted to have an objective look at whether or not our global drug policies work. And for the third time, they actually failed to do anything <laughs> substantive, surprise, surprise. And, you know, I could talk about why that's the case, but I don't want to do that. I want to talk about something else, about sort of how our drug policies have played out. It's pretty clear, I think, that we understand that when it comes to the war on drugs, that it's actually been a hugely successful tool. It's a tool of social control. And to the degree that it's a tool of social control in the same way that alcohol prohibition was a tool for social control, it's been immensely successful in that once you identify or label someone as a drug user or a drug offender, then you no longer have to assume any responsibility for their education status, their access to housing, whether or not they have employment, what kind of family they grew up in, any of the other what we call social determinants of health and outcome, they all fall by the wayside as being important once we can put the label of drug, illicit drug user on a person. So in that regard, it's been an incredibly successful tool in that way. And it's also been successful in its secondary role, which is to reduce the ability of people of color and marginalized people to be competitive. And, you know, many people would argue that's one of the main reasons that we have it. But the other part of it that has been less focused on is how it's hurt white people in the sense that it has them unable to see drug problems in their own community, because that's what happens to other people. So it's not until you get a large number of bodies that they actually can admit that opiates and drug abuse is a problem for them. And for me, that's particularly perverse because, um, <laughs> well, in the sense that, you know, in any other realm, if we had a conversation, if we said that we were going to criminalize, you know, fornication and adultery like we once did, and the only people who got arrested and prosecuted for that were black and brown people, everybody would know that there was something wrong with that because nobody would believe that white people didn't engage in that behavior. And even if we didn't think it, all we'd have to do is look at each other to know it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I mean, well, for I some know. reason, <laughs> when it comes to drugs, we're able to engage in this prolonged period of denial. 
that allows people to just pretend that what's so for them is not true. And so for me as a person who cares about policy and public health, I feel like this is an opportunity for white America to actually wake up and see the cost to themselves of, of like maintaining this racialized view of what drugs are about and who has the problem. But the final thing I wanted to say about this is how, how it all relates to the issue of capitalism, which again, we don't talk about. And for me, it has to do with the fact that we don't talk about why is it that the countries that consume the most amount of drugs are also the richest countries. Mm. If our lives were so good, and everything was so great, why is it that we're trying to escape more than others? I think it's because we have collapsed consumerism with democracy. We've collapsed consumerism with freedom. We actually think that our ability to buy stuff that we don't need and that will eventually be unuseful is the measure of who we are and our importance as human beings. And the opportunity, because Sherilyn talked about thinking big, so I want us to think about what it would mean to build an economy that's not based on producing and consuming products that we don't need and that are going to be unuseful. The truth is, is that almost every product that is made today can be made better by machines and more efficiently. So it's not a sustainable economy. But the thing that machines can't do, that only we can do, is build human potential. So what if we actually had an economy that was based on building the best human beings that we could be, teaching each other the knowledge that we have to share, actually building us out to be everything that we are capable of and we have no idea of that capability right now. Those are jobs that cannot be replaced by machines that actually provide a greater level of human happiness because humans are happier helping each other and doing things for each other than consuming stuff. So we would actually get rid of some of these other social problems. And it's a sustainable economy that would actually support us respecting each other. To me, that's thinking big. I hope that you know, we can use these forums as an opportunity to talk about how do we use public health to begin to deconstruct racism and give meaning to building up human beings instead of property. So, so one of the things that is very important for me, regardless uh, of context, but especially in the context of uh, dealing with uh, racism and even talking about substance use, is humanity. And, and I'm very appreciative that you said that the lack of humanity uh, that we see in so many manifestations of racism and all the other isms and all the other systems in place that create division uh, among us. And one of the things that I do on my level uh, with those with whom I get to interact is to uh, facilitate uh, the restoration of humanity. Because again, we, we can talk about all the policies we want, but you have to be in the right mindset. You have to know that your life matters. I can't just tell you your life matters. You have to believe your life matters and come to that decision and that conclusion on your own for it to be solidified. So one of the things that I do, um, particularly with those who are recovering, um, from substance abuse uh, is, again, using storytelling. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are hearing more about the narrative. You know, what is the narrative when it comes to this? What is the narrative that comes with that? And I'm glad that people are finally on that boat. I'm, I come from a research background, so I, I'm all into statistics and analyses and blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't matter whether it's here, it doesn't matter whether it's over at Hampton House, it doesn't matter whether it's over at Wall Street. I can talk to researchers, politicians, policy makers, doesn't matter. Everybody loves a good story. Why? Because it taps into your humanity. You can't analyze statistically a story. You have to look at it with this. You have to look at it with this. So why do I do it? Because, as you said, because of the systems of in, uh, in place, because of the war on drugs, not only with all um, those particular aspects on a macro level, but on a micro level, it has sucked away humanity from those who have suffered from this, that, or the other associated with the war on drugs. And, and I think we have to get back to, again, restoring the humanity of people who have been so marginalized and dehumanized because of the systems that are in place. It, it seems very simple. Uh, you know, I, I could produce papers that, that, that talk about it, but to me, it, it's something that we all are, are in our capability of doing. You could do it, Corey. You could do it right now. You have been doing it. 
restoring humanity through the stories, allowing people to claim, reclaim their humanity through acknowledging the virtues that they possess. You know, again, we are all unfortunately pawns in this game. You know, and in one way or another, it's taken away some aspect of our humanity, but we are well within our powers to reclaim it by acknowledging uh, our experiences, understanding, you know, be, besides love, I think the second greatest virtue is understanding. If I can acknowledge and appreciate your experience, whether it's the complete opposite of mine, whether you see me through a particular lens because of the systems that were in place because of your existence, we can get to a place where we can start addressing these larger macro level, policy level solutions. But we have to understand each other. We have to listen, not just hear, but listen to each other. To so acknowledge our differences, understand the discourse that comes with the differences in our thought process and the differences in our experience. But in that, we recognize the humanity. And I think we lose touch with that so much because we just think about policies and laws and we think about um, what do we have to put on paper to restore humanity. We don't need a damn piece of paper to restore humanity. We don't. I think we've been conditioned to think so, but no. We can do it amongst ourselves. There's a, there's a term that's used a lot, collective efficacy. <laughs> yeah, I see you laugh. Yeah, exactly. It's not a, no, but it's, it's not a word that we, we use enough. And, and uh, in, in communicating with, with Dr. Grills, I, I, I'm going to change it up a little. Communal efficacy. So not just acknowledging that we have to interact with each other in order for society to run, but I'm so invested in you, investment. I'm so invested in you. I'm invested in your outcomes. I'm invested in your success. Your success is my success. Your failure is my failure. So I'm not even going to worry about me because there's enough faith inside me to know that you're worrying about me. So I'm just going to use my energy and worry about you. So you want to talk about a, a policy recommendation? If we have enough communal efficacy in our neighborhoods, we don't need the police. How about that for a policy change? How about that for a recommendation? Where we're looking out for each other. We don't want to destroy our neighborhoods. There's actual ownership of our neighborhoods that we don't want to destroy, that we don't need outside forces policing us. We don't need y'all to police us. Give us a chance. Give us an opportunity to look out for each other, but give us equal claim to do it. And, no, not even equal. Equitable claim to do it. Put us back on square one and watch what we do. So, um, the reason I shifted over here is because this is where the laptop is, where questions come in. Uh, and I'd feel badly if I didn't, if I ignored them. So I'm going to at least share one with you and ask any, any of our panelists to uh, share their thoughts on it. Um, the question is, what's the responsibility of the media in framing the restructuring of our social system? And maybe the more important next related question is, how can we get them on board? They Could you repeat us? that question again? Sure. What's the responsibility of the media in framing media. the restructuring of social systems? We've talked a lot about structure here. And uh, the, the question is, how do we get them on board? Well, I can go to another one sure. if you'd rather not I, do that I, one. Uh, I I am opposed to talking about the media as though it is an entity that exists outside of us. Um, it, 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 without question, um, has its own drivers, which are not about the sharing and dissemination of information, but about profit. Um, and that profit um, demands a certain kind of presentation. But I guess I want to return to um, the points that David was just making and fold this into that, which is if we want the result that David and even the result that Deborah um, have advanced today, we want a communal sense, we want um, a society in which we are building human capital and not simply consuming, it's not, that is not something that can happen from one day to the next. So we have to set the conditions that provide the platform for that to happen. And those conditions are physical, those conditions are institutional, 
Those conditions are educational. Those conditions are um, health related. All of the things that we need to be able to make the kind of move that both David and Deborah are talking about are currently absent from contemporary United States life. And so the move away from the public, which is a dialogue that has really taken deep root over the last 30 years, and frankly, it really began with Brown, right? You know, we, we loved our public education system until it, it had to be shared with black people. Then we didn't love it so much. Then people wanted to withdraw. The dismantling of public life, of the public space, of the public university, the privatization of prisons, the elevation of the private has taken away the conditions in which this idea of commonality and humanity can flourish. It has separated us from each other. It has separated, at least in our own minds, our destiny from another. It has created the illusion that we can run from certain people and that we should run from certain people. So I guess my plea would be, and the media is part of that because the media is supposed to be a public good. It's supposed to be a public institution that helps each of us be better citizens because we become educated about our world and then we can properly exercise the right to vote and engage as civic beings. So that's all part of our public life too. We got to the point now where we don't even think newspapers serve a public function. It's all about profit. We'll see media platforms collapse because it wasn't making enough money, even if it was uh, an important and valuable source of information to people in the community. So all of this, the privatization of our lives, the privatization of our education, the privatization of prisons, the privatization of every aspect of our life, has undermined the conditions in which the kind of interaction and communality that um, David and Deborah talked about could possibly flourish. And in my view, we have to set about creating the conditions, using our policies, our practices, our laws, our vote to demand the conditions in which we can achieve precisely what they're describing. I say ditto to all of that, and I just want to go back to saying that we actually have to change the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are. I remember when I first started thinking about that being an American meant that I had to understand more about British history and really examining what I had learned in school and what was really true. I was amazed. I mean, we're told that we came from people who were fleeing religious persecution, but the truth is, is that they were the persecutors you know, who were trying to impose their view on other people. And so they got kicked out of their country and came here and did that. It's like we still have a conversation that says that America was majority white. It was only ever majority white if you forget the people who were here when the white folks first came and all the people that they brought after. It's like there is this conversation about who America is and what it is that's never been true. And I'll just leave you with this thought. To me, there's something particularly weird, perverse, however you want to call it, about a country that defines itself in terms of a dream. Because by definition, dreams are not real. They're what happen when you're unconscious. We could call ourselves the American promise, the American potential, all kinds of stuff, but we call it a dream. And that's because it is. It's never been true. No, I'm serious. I'm really serious. And I, 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 I'm serious because, you know, there have been a number of reports over the last six months talking about rising mortality rates of low-income, blue-collar white people. And I feel like they are dying for a dream. They are dying because they grew up to believe that there was a certain way that their life was supposed to be. But that was based on an illusion because the period of time that we used to define the American dream was 30 years out of 200 and some odd year history. And the only reason we looked good then was because the rest of the world was in shambles. So like what does that mean that we've created our national identity inside of that? There's no way that we can ever do any of the things that we're talking about here if we hold on to that as if it's real. And we all are working in the area of mental health, public health, physical health. We are a country in desperate need of mental health correction. 
Like for real, we're just not really present to it. So and I'm not saying that, that it's like just black people, white people, it's all of us. We are in desperate need of mental health correction. And if those of us in these institutions don't start talking about it and developing what that looks like, we're going to be sitting here 50 years from now even more crazy and screwed up than we are today. <laughs> Always got to follow up on that. Oh my God. I'm, I'm going to just keep it real simple. I feel like I've said everything I needed to say. Uh, uh, again, it, it all comes down to perspective. I think we've been hearing that word a lot uh, today, perspective, the lens by which we see uh, our reality. Uh, we need to open ourselves to uh, a holistic perspective, stepping outside our comfort zone. These are all hot, you know, hot button words that we, we've heard, but really doing it, really allowing yourself to step into discomfort. This conversation is not easy. It's not easy to think about, it's not easy to talk about, and it's even harder to enact. <laughs> That's okay. Embrace that. We are talking about trying to undo a system that has been perfect from 1619 to, uh, we're going on what, 2016? We're not going to fix it in a day, yo. That's okay. Because everything you contribute to the eradication of institutional racism matters. Your input matters. The way that you are combating this system does matter. It's important, it's important to me. As a black male, it's important to me. So I think we have to sit back, and, for one, and appreciate where we are. The fact that we can have this conversation in this institution <laughs> in this institution, I repeat that, is progress. I get it. We're not as far along as we want to go. I get that. But let's not marginalize where we have gotten to at this point. Let that be the motivation to keep going. I have my motivation. Number one is my life, and number two is the life of my two-year-old son. So I have my motivation to try to change up the system as best I can before the Lord calls me home. I hope that we are all motivated for whatever reasons. We know it's not right. This doesn't sit well in our soul. It doesn't sit well that just because of this, that you consider me less than and all the systems that you put in place just reinforce this marginalization of my life. Like Zora Neale Hurston said, who wouldn't want to be in my company? Okay? Who wouldn't want to be in my company? Why wouldn't I want to be in, in your company? I know I do. So again, it's about understanding, it's about acknowledgement. And it, easier said than done, to acknowledge existence, to acknowledge circumstances, to acknowledge the things that have affected us, our thought process, because they aren't easy. They aren't easy conversations, but they are the necessary conversations to have. And I tr trust me when I say this, I've seen it when working with my clients in West Baltimore, the way their minds are open when they understand the journey of their lives you know, before, during, and after substance abuse. We can, have a, we can have a journey before, during, and after institutional racism. We have to have that conversation and acknowledge the totality of the experience. And when we do that, I'm telling you, all these policies, all these laws that we need to enact in order to reinforce this change in mentality, the emotional and psychological and mental emancipation that I hope we all get, black, white, and different, is going to make it that much easier. Um, I want to apologize that I can't get to further questions because we, we need to move on with our program. But I really want to thank our speaker and discussants for an uh, credible, engaging, uh, thought-provoking session. <laughs>